This is the root of the wild sarsaparilla plant. If you're interested in hearing how this can be used as a food, and as a medicine, and as a delicious drink, keep watching. All right, before we begin, it's important to first discuss any time that you are thinking about consuming a wild plant, either as a food or a medicine, it's important that you do your research. Learn to identify it for what it is to make sure there are no lookalikes that you don't want to be consuming. Make sure that you're using it for the right reasons and you're prepared it in the right way. Finally, when you are satisfied with those, try it in small quantities to see how your body's going to react to it. Okay, now, before we can actually start talking about this plant, we have to first learn how to identify it. So what we're going to do is go into the woods where I have found some wild sarsaparilla plant and I'll show you how I harvest them. We'll bring them back here to the kitchen in my home and we'll talk a little bit more about how they can be used as a food, as a medicine, and as a delicious drink. So in looking for the sarsaparilla plant, you want to look in the understory under some rather mature trees, although you can find it just about anywhere, I think. Uh, this is a really good spot for it. The woods that I'm standing in now are mostly hardwoods. I'm looking at quite a few maples, some red maple, what looks like some sugar maple, some birch, however, there is some spruce here. And what well, you're looking towards the ground. Now, this time of year, it tends to stand out very clearly. You can see these plants right here. And I'll bring you in for a closer look so you can do a better for identification. They are start, they're at, well, they're at their end of their life for the year. And there's more all through the woods back there. During the early summer, from spring right through most of the summer into the early fall, they have a bright green color and a few in the back over there where they're shaded uh, still have a bright green color. But as they come to the end of their seasonal life, they start to yellow and then brown and eventually they'll, they'll die off. Now this is the best time of year to harvest these, although you could harvest them earlier in the summer. But the reason the fall makes the best time to harvest these plants is because this is when the energy of the plant is returning from its leaves and going into its roots to go dormant over the winter. So all the most the nutrients, the health benefits, and even the flavor is now settling into its roots. Now the other reason it's so good to pick this time of the year, let me just move this fern out of the way. The other reason it's so good to pick this time of the year is because you're going to have the least impact on its reproduction. You are going to be taking its root, but most of these plants, well, not every plant, but every so many plants, uh, it's hard to tell which, will produce berries, a cluster of berries on the end of a stalk, and I'll include a picture on the screen, and it will come up on a separate stalk right next to the primary stalk of the plant. Now look at this one, right on the side of a rock. Very shallow root system, as you'll see in a second. And those berries have long since fallen off the plant and have found their way into the earth so that they can grow new ones next year. Now, of course, it will regrow from the root, as you'll see when I pull one up in a minute. But this is the time of year you're going to have the least amount of impact on the plant and you're going to get the maximum amount of nutrients and flavor. Okay, I'll set up the camera so you can see how I harvest the sarsaparilla root. All right, so here's a good example that I'm going to harvest for you. Now, I'm just going to give you a little closer look at the plant, and we'll talk a little bit about anything that might look like this that you should know so you can identify it. Uh, not that uh, there are very many things that look like this plant, to be honest, but there is one that in one stage of its life is very similar in nature, and uh, it, it's the one you do want to be careful about. So this plant, as it grows out of the earth in the early spring, It'll start breaking down into three primary stalks, or three stalks off of the primary. And what you'll see is, right now there's five leaves, two, four, and five, sharply serrated, deeply veined, lighter color on the underside, and of course over the summer, they, uh, they're quite bright green, even greener than this one, this leaf here is. But early in the spring, they have a very deep, bronzy, reddish color. Well, there is one other plant that can be confused with it, and that is poison ivy. So it, it is worth your while to be aware of what poison ivy looks like early in the spring. Now, the truth is, you're not going to be harvesting this at that time of the year anyway. You're going to wait until it's, uh, well, ideally this time of year in the early fall to harvest this plant. But it's good to know that 
there is a, a similar plant that you want to be aware of. However, as I said, you're not going to harvest it when it's first coming out of the ground anyway. So again, long stem, this one running about 12, maybe 13 inches out of the ground, breaks into three stems, and each stem has five. I have seen seven, but most of the time it's just five on the, each of those stems. So what you're looking to do is clear a little bit away at the girth. When it's wet like this, and, and most of the time it's usually in damper ground anyway, right down here at the bottom, the plant root starts just at the leaf litter. It only goes down an inch or two at the most, and then it runs off at an angle just under the surface. So if you just reach in with your fingers, now you could create a digging stick and uh, use that to assist you, especially if it's a very rooty earth and you're trying to pull it away from the other roots, it might help. But just feel along the root with your fingers, very easy in the duff, and I can feel this one is running in this direction. Oh, it's a little deeper than some of them. This is a big plant too. Let's see. Challenge yourself to see how far you can get along the root. It does have some spurs off of it that you can try and pull, but to be honest, it's a lot easier just to stay with the main root. <laughs> this one is considerably deeper than most of them. I think I may stop just down here. Wow, it is going for a long distance though. Let's see if I can get a little bit more out of it. Oh, I can smell it already. It's got a really nice smell in my mind. It's a, a peppery, almost like a ginger. Okay, let's see if I can break it here. There we go. Okay. So here's what the root is looking like. Now, it's only the root that we're, con we're concerned with, so you can break the top off, toss that away, and uh, collect up a number of these. Now, it's not the whole root we're going to use. It's the outer portion of the root. There is a more sturdy cord running down the center that we're going to pull away from it. But I can do that when I get home, and I'll show you a little bit more. There's the, the core that I'm talking about. But even right now, I can smell that gingery uh, root beer kind of a smell. But it's not until you process it that you can really tell the root beer flavor to it. So what I'm going to do, there's a good number of these around here. I'll pick a couple, and I'll probably get maybe three or four more pieces like this. And we'll take those home, and then we'll talk about how to process them into not only a medicine, but a very enjoyable drink as well. All right, as you saw in the video, this is one of the roots that I harvested from the wild sarsaparilla plant out in the woods. And I'm going to show you how I separate the fleshy outside part away from the hard inner core and then also talk about how you can use this. So it's also important to understand that there is another plant that goes by the name sarsaparilla, hence this one is known as the wild sarsaparilla plant. So they are two different plants. This plant is found primarily on the eastern side of North America from the east coast westward as far as Manitoba and Canada and as far south as North Carolina in the United States. So historically, this root has been used as a mer an emergency food by our First Nations people when times when they found other food sources were scarce. It's also used by First Nations people as a energy food while they're out on, in the woods hunting. Basically, all they have to do is to pull some of this up, strip away the outer fleshy part, and chew it. I've done this myself and found it to be quite tasty. It has a kind of a spicy, gingery taste. I can't say for sure how much energy I derive from it, but it is a tasty nail trivel a lot to have as well. Medicinally, this has been used both internally and externally. Internally, it's used for or has been used for things like rheumatism, as well as bronchial and pulmonary in, and infections, and coughs as well. Externally, it has been ground into a powder and used as a poultice for skin conditions like eczemas, rashes, and other scrapes and cuts. I can't verify any of its medicinal use. I like it primarily as a drink. Now, in order to turn this into a drink, what I have done is, um, again, stripped away the flesh from the, the core, chopped it into smaller pieces, put it in a quantity of water, put that on to simmer, and left it on there for a period of time until some of the volume is reduced. That's known as a decoction. And then when it has that a nice browny, amberish color. Then I cool it in the fridge overnight, and uh, then I'll add some sweetener to it and have it the next day. 
If you were to do that, you're going to recognize the taste as very much like root beer. Now, this is not the original ingredient in root beer, but it has been used as a substitute in root beer. Now, I do have a friend who does the same thing as I do, except he takes it one step further. He has a soda stream machine at home, so after his decoction is cooled and he can sweeten it to the degree that he likes, he then runs it through the soda stream and, has, and carbonates it, and he says it's virtually identical to store-bought root beer with, in his mind, healthier and a better taste. Okay, what I'd like to do now is just take a moment to show you how I process the root of the wild sarsaparilla plant prior to placing it in a pot of water for decoction. So what I would normally do is bring them home. As you can see, I've got the quantity of roots here that I harvested. I would bring them home, rinse them off just to remove any surface d uh, dirt on them. And then you can, with your fingernail usually, is just reach right into the plant, start to pull away the flesh. And what you'll find very quickly is the hardcore root underneath it. Now, the fleshier the, the root, the, the easier it is to strip away. But you can see that's pulling away from the, the root there. It take, can take a little bit of time. Some are easy, more forgiving or more willing to give up their, their flesh than others. But by and large, it's, it's pretty easy to do. No special tools required. All right, so this one didn't produce a whole lot off of that strand of the root, but... I have a number of pieces here that I can use. All right, I think I've got most of what I can off of that. And this is what's left behind. It's just a core that has no real value to you. So here is the small quantity off of that root. And I'll do the same with the rest of these. Sometimes it's easier. Let's see if I can find another one that has to work towards the end where it's a little fatter. And then I can pull it off there and literally just pull the hard inner core away from the soft flesh until you get to a joint like that, of course, and then you start again. And where the root is sometimes fattest and oldest and closer to the stalk of the plant, it is, can be a little tougher. You can see how much thicker that core is than has been on the rest of it. But this is what I would do, is work away to get most of all, well, all the flesh that I can, reasonably, off of the core. And when that's done, and I've got this quantity here. I'll just chop it up into smaller pieces. Not too small, half inch to an inch long. It's really not all that important. What I'm trying to do is just expose more surface area. But I don't want it so small that I have a lot of residue in the pot afterwards. And then I'll just add to that to the pot of water. I don't I can't give you precise quantities of water per root or by weight, but uh, I like to make it kind of strong. You can always uh, add additional water if you find the taste is too strong. So it's nice to make a very strong decoction to start with. Optionally, if you don't want to work with the fresh root right away and bring it home, you can do the same thing that I've done here, either in a dehydrator or on a screen. It'll dry out naturally, is to allow it to, to dry out, and then it can either be run through a grinder or, or chopped up even finer or even pulverized with, with a mortise and pestle. And uh, then you can use that to create your decoction on with later, or you can use that for your medicinal purposes. Okay, let's quickly wrap this video up. Okay, this was just intended to be a short primer on the wild sarsaparilla root, how you can find it in the woods, how you can harvest it, how you can process it and turn it into a food, a medicine, or a delicious drink. I would encourage you to look further into the wild sarsaparilla root and then take a walk through the woods and see if you can find some for yourself. If you have any questions about wild sarsaparilla or anything else for that matter, please put them in the comments section below. But until I get out with another video, get out and explore yourself and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.